Hi, I'm Jennifer. I'm an inpatient nurse practitioner for the IBD service at the University of Chicago. I primarily work on the um, inpatient service, but I also share a post-operative clinic with Michelle Rubin as well. Um, so Dr. Kornbluth and I are going to change gears a little bit to talk about the severely active um, ulcerative colitis patient. So we currently have right now a patient, a 26-year-old female with a history of ulcerative colitis, diagnosed in 2011. Um, she initially on colonoscopy had only mild inflammation just to the proximal sigmoid colon. So based on the mild inflammation, she was initiated on Lialda 4.8 grams as monotherapy. She was doing well until she completed a course of antibiotics. She took amoxicillin for a sinusitis infection. Subsequent to that, um, she developed a C. diff infection and was treated with a two-week course of vancomycin. Clinical picture-wise, um, she did have initial improvement initially with her diarrhea, but not complete resolution of her symptoms. Her outpatient stool studies were checked again. It's been a couple weeks later. We just wanted to make sure that she didn't have recurrence of C. diff if she possibly needed a longer taper of the vancomycin. Those were negative as well as ovine parasite and stool culture. She had an outpatient colonoscopy again that now revealed severely active colitis up to the hepatic flexure. Um, she received then an outpatient loading dose of Remicade, five milligrams per kilogram, but again, she didn't have response. So then she, we decided to admit her for a course of IV steroids, but unfortunately, again, she failed to show any significant improvement after about three days. And three days is usually kind of our window before we decide if we need to kind of think about um, advancements in her medical therapy. So she continued even after the three days of IV steroids to have 10 to 12 bloody bowel movements, again, with severe urgency, tenesmus, and nocturnal bowel, nocturnal bowel movements and crampy abdominal pain. Workup-wise, her albumin was low at 2.6. That's definitely a factor that you want to um, assess just to make sure that the medical therapy you do choose for her, that she'll be able to retain the medical therapy. Um, her hemoglobin was low at 8.5, hematocrit 27%, platelets 377. She does produce CRP. Hers was elevated at 15. Again, you check stool cultures. C. diff was negative, um, as we explained before. Her serum CMV was negative. You decided to do a flexible sigmoidoscopy that now shows um, severely active colitis from the proximal sigmoid colon with no transition of normal mucosa that's seen. Um, biopsies were checked for CMV and all immunostains were negative. Um, and now Dr. Kornbluth will kind of touch base on what's the clinician to do in treatment of this patient with severe colitis. Thank you, Jennifer. I think it's a great case. Thanks for putting that together. Um, so I'll be speaking about how to manage a patient, a hospitalized patient with severe UC, and it's really a, this presentation is tailor-made. And so what do you do for a patient who's hospitalized? So this patient's already gotten the IV steroids for three days. A couple points I want to make. The episode during which a patient extends from distal disease to more proximal disease is often a harbinger of a very difficult episode to treat, and that's a patient uh, I'll jump all over, whether it's with steroids, starting an antitina, et cetera. Fear that episode during which a patient goes from proctitis or proctosigmonitis to extensive disease, and that was the uh, scenario here. So in terms of the uh, options we have, uh, we have uh, steroids continuing them, and we'll talk about when it's time to stop, uh, cyclosporin, and University of Chicago is one of the few places that was using it besides Mount Sinai, uh, infliximab, and surgery. Let me start by saying you will almost never do the wrong thing by referring this patient with severe steroid refractory colitis for surgery. I've looked at a bunch of malpractice cases for severe colitis, and the mistake was never the patient went for surgery too soon in the hospital. It was always that the patient was treated for too long with futile therapy, typically perforates. So you won't go wrong by deciding to skip infliximab, that might not be working, skip cyclosporin, and go to surgery. Keep that in mind. You have certain prognostic factors, and you probably can imagine, and it's, uh, we have good data, that the bad prognostic signs 
are in large part based upon what it looks like endoscopically, and as well as other uh, findings we'll talk about. And I don't think anybody here would believe that a patient with this kind of uh, deep ulceration in the colon is going to get better with a few more days of any kind of medical therapy. These patients who have lost most of their mucosal uh, layer, likewise, tough to imagine they're going to get better. Mucosal abrasions, well, these patients might get better. They still have an intense, uh, uh, intact mucosa. And here, multiple punched out but less deep ulcers. Maybe that patient will get better. We're not going to make an entire decision based upon the way it looks. But again, there are going to be certain appearances that are going to tip our hand uh, that a patient's not likely to get better. In terms of IV steroids, this was a very uh, nice review by Dan Turner from Hadass in Israel. Looked at a total of 32 cohort studies between 74 and 2006, so relatively uh, recent years as well. 27% of patients coming into the hospital uh, for IV steroids needed a colectomy. Um, and that has not improved uh, in terms of the last 30 years, including the more recent uh, anti-TNF era, if you don't treat them early enough. How long to wait before calling steroids a failure? This is the easy one. Blood in the stools, more than six balance a day, that patient won't get better in all likelihood uh, with continued IV steroids, and it's time to at, uh, act at day three. The old uh, tendency to wait day five, day seven, day 10, that patient is going to be a setup for a failure and potentially a disaster. So early alternative medical surgical therapy. And I would say if that patient has already uh, gotten their loading dose with infliximab, I'm not sure. Well, I know I would not have put the patient in the hospital just for another uh, three days of IV steroids without acting uh, on another therapy. So what's the outcome with IV cyclosporin? Which very, how many people in the room have used IV cyclosporin for severe colitis? So that's more than in most places in the country. I think that's uh, in large part thanks to the influence of University of Chicago, who were involved in the initial uh, trials as well. And there is uh, some reluctance and hesitation to use it because of its um, unfamiliarity, because we're not transplant uh, people for the most part. But if you look at the uh, efficacy rates to get patients out of the hospital, it's about 80% looking across a number of randomized controlled trials. So that number is pretty good. The problem is, if they have already failed 6MP, then you don't have a bridge to anywhere. It's the quote unquote bridge to nowhere before the era of infliximab, and that's a tricky uh, transition as we'll see. Or now, cyclosporin, and Dave has published a, an abstract at this year's DDW, using cyclosporin as a quick fix jump start to using vetolizumab. Vetolizumab by itself has not been studied in the hot patient in the hospital, so I don't consider that an option right now. So you need to have uh, something to bridge it to. The serious complications are lower with the lower doses. We used to treat four mg per kg. Now it's two mg per kg. Uh, we do give PCP prophylaxis, and the, the bad infections are probably due in large part to prolonged steroid therapy. Moving on to infliximab, which almost everybody, how many people in the room have had IV steroid failures in the hospital that they've used infliximab for? Okay, so just about everyone. So this is what people have felt more comfortable with. And the question was, are you doing uh, just as well with IV infliximab as you were with IV cyclosporin? And the answer is, the CISIF study gave us this information. This was a hard to enroll patient uh, study. This was done, it took about eight years to enroll across all of France, because you're telling a patient, I am going to randomize you after IV steroid failure to either infliximab or cyclosporin. I don't know which one is best, and if you fail, you're going for colectomy. And you say, doctor, can't you pick one? No, if you go in the trial, it's going to be a uh, toss-up. So it took quite some time. Over 100 patients were ultimately enrolled, and there were 55 on cyclosporin, 56 on infliximab, two primary endpoints, leaving the hospital on day seven with a clinical response, not needing colectomy, and at three months, uh, no colectomy, okay? Two primary endpoints, sort of coarse uh, endpoints, but that's what they were, and at day seven, identical response rates, 80 plus percent for both cyclosporin, which has been the historical number, as well as with a single dose of infliximab, which is different than this patient, which I'll describe in a second, and then at day 98, identical colectomy rate. So if you never use cyclosporin, you say, gee, am I using a second rate therapy with infliximab? That's not the case. Infliximab is just as effective. But what do we do in a patient like this who has already gotten their five mg per kg a week earlier? So we have a number of studies that have shown us that the levels of infliximab in the blood 
plummet or might even be absent even within a few days of it, its administration, not because of antibodies, because it's being sopped up in this big, hot, inflammatory uh, colon, and you could actually measure uh, infliximab levels in the stool. So some of these patients we've dosed empirically earlier or even double dosed. Some of us have even given them 10 mg per kg as their first dose in a situation like that based on zero data, uh, based on zero prospective data, and we have no idea whether we're just perhaps increasing the risk of infection or, in fact, increasing their colectomy-free rate. Having said that, if you have a patient who's tanking, uh, it might be reasonable to uh, give them a double dose up front uh, or soon after the first dose. You won't be able to get back a level in time to make that decision, so it's a clinical decision. The other point I would make in this patient, you've had two negative C diffs. I don't know if it was a PCR or not. Without a PCR, you might need up to five uh, stools to prove you have a C diff infection. This patient's already had one. So the ID people will go crazy if, if they hear that I'll say out loud that I might treat the patient empirically with Vanco in the hospital and run the risk of creating VRE in the hospital, vanco resistant enterococci. But if a patient has nowhere to go but colectomy, I might try giving them uh, a repeated course of vancomycin in this patient. What happens if you give the first therapy, patient doesn't get better? First of all, again, if the patient's getting worse, colectomy. You won't go wrong by operating on that patient. And as you'll see, you can might give the patient the alternative therapy. And we looked at this at Sinai. There's subsequently a larger uh, experience from Jeté that I'll show you from France. And there was a beautiful uh, review by one of our IBD fellows last month in the IBD <coughs> journal that shows that you can achieve a remission with the second drug. But if you're giving it within 30 days of the first drug, you have risks of serious complications, death, pancreatitis, um, some of these perhaps not uh, fatal, but in this case, this was fatal. The Jetaid group was about the same. At 12 months, you salvaged about 40% uh, of the colons. Uh, the rest went to colectomy and exposing the patients to potential risk. Subsequent studies at Niraj Nural, our IBD fellow, did not find quite this high a complication rate, but I would say if the patient is older, if the patient has, quote, poor protoplasm, patient uh, is going to be at higher risk for infection, I would not do this. Again, colectomy might be the way to go. Venous thromboembolism, I make the point here that this is not something we should think about. Uh, I just changed the slide a little while ago. Sub-Q heparin is not uh, to be considered. A sub-Q heparin should be given to all patients and not just post-op patients, but all patients who come in with severe IBD in the hospital, they can get uh, venous or arterial thrombosis. I've seen uh, CNS thromboses and stroke. I've seen myocardial infarctions. Uh, patients die with recurrent VT, uh, venal thrombosis. Bus, uh, embolism. David Sacker taught me, there's no data on this, that if a patient has uh, a, a thrombobolic event and is not doing too bad, quote unquote, you can heparinize that patient with full dose heparin and hope they don't bleed. But with the second thromboembolic event in the hospital, they go straight for surgery because their next thromboembolic event might be the fatal one. I get to show these pictures. This is a patient who did not get heparinized uh, after their first thromboembolic event. Uh, this actually goes back a couple of decades, but it's quite um, striking and makes the point. This is both um, uh, venous and arterial thromboembolic uh, event. This is what the colon looked like, uh, absolutely uh, terribly diseased. This uh, goes through a hole in the colon. This patient already perforated. And this is what the patient's arm looked like uh, now 25 years later. So uh, you can rescue these patients with colectomy. So top 10 pearls and pitfalls in managing severe UC. Waiting too long for oral prednisone to work, whether it's an outpatient or inpatient, is a mistake. Think about uh, at the very uh, latest three days, and maybe not even that long. Consider the differential diagnosis and superimposed factors, especially C. diff. CMV, you can only diagnose really on biopsy. Having a, a CMV PCR on the serum is really meaningless. I wouldn't waste time waiting for a clearance of that, and it probably is not clinically important at all. Recognize the outpatient medical failure quickly, as was the case here. 
maintain extreme vigilance in the sick patient. Obviously, sick, these patients are all sick, older, hypoalbuminemic, febrile, a patient who has uh, continued fevers, might already be harboring a uh, walled off perforation. That's a patient I'm going to have a very low threshold to send to surgery. I don't think I've ever seen a patient who has an albumin in the region of two who's avoided colectomy. Um, this patient had an albumin of 3.4. Also remember when the patient comes in, that initial albumin might be in the setting of uh, hemoconcentration. Once you uh, treat the patient, hydrate them, that albumin might really show their true colors. Remembering long-standing ulcerative colitis, the patient's been sick for 20 or 30 years, uh, it's probably time to move on and have their surgery. If you consider cyclosporin and fliximab, again, I keep making this point earlier and early, uh, again and again, day five clearly is uh, too late. Get the surgeon into chat with the patient now. It, once you recognize that the patient is not getting immediately better, you don't want to walk in on day four and say, oh my God, you failed. You're going for a, a subtotal colectomy. You're going to have a temporary ileostomy. Have the surgeon come in early. You have great surgeons here in the University of Chicago. Neil Hyman's done hundreds and hundreds of these operations. They almost always, in the absence of a perforation, are done uh, laparoscopically. Uh, and in this setting, you should never have a one stage um, uh, ileoanal pouch uh, to complete, complete the operations. Fulminant colitis, you don't have three days to wait. Exsanguinating hemorrhage, patient goes to the OR. Uh, toxic megacolon, not better than 24 hours, goes to the OR. Reasonable goal to avoid surgery if you can. Pouch uh, is a disease in itself, perhaps. We don't have a curative, truly curative operation for ulcerative colitis. We now create the universe of potential pouch problems. Uh, there's a, about 20% a significant reduction in female fertility. Male impotence is not uh, a tiny uh, risk factor. But remember, in the sick, unresponsive patients, we're not here to save colons. We're here to save the lives of these patients. There's still a mortality rate of about 1% in the year 2015, and we want to improve patients' quality of life. Thank you very much.